Well, the rationale behind determination was uh, several things. Uh, the most important primary goal was to evaluate the impact uh, of very exciting three drug combinations, so-called triplet regimen, uh, on outcome in newly diagnosed patients with multiple myeloma who were eligible for stem cell transplant and to evaluate um, the impact of autologous stem cell transplant in that setting, as well as better understand the best timing of that approach, whether it could be used early or kept in reserve and used later. And then very importantly, to evaluate the impact of lenalidomide maintenance until progression and compare this with our partners in France who are doing an identical trial, um, but for various regulatory reasons, um, were unable to prolong their maintenance beyond one year. So we had this unique opportunity to, to pair identical parallel studies, evaluate lenalidomide maintenance until progression in the US experience based upon our own randomized trials, which have suggested survival benefits of this approach. And at the same time, further investigate um, the optimal timing of transplant in the setting of highly effective triplet induction remission therapy. Now, what we found was, first and foremost, we showed that there was a progression-free survival benefit with the use of early transplant and lenalidomide maintenance until progression. This was quite dramatic and actually um, outstripped our expectation of at least 12 months. And in fact, there was about a 21 month difference between the two arms at around 46 months medium progression free survival if you kept transplant in reserve. Conversely, if you used it early, um, that actually improved to around 67 months, which was some of the best results we've seen for either approach um, to date in this setting. What was particularly important, though, is that whilst we saw this PFS difference in favor of early transplant with um, the use of, of the use of high-dose melphalan early, showing that clearly melphalan matters, was that at the same time, we did not see an overall survival benefit with relatively mature follow-up. Now, this was a very important finding. And what we also found was that in the delayed transplant arm, in contrast to, for example, our French partners in whom transplant had been used in the delayed setting, in the vast majority of patients, approaching almost 80%, we saw almost the opposite in the US experience, but with keeping transplant for around 28% of patients, but indeed about 72% of them not receiving immediate transplant, we saw an, an identical survival outcome, which we have to be careful how we interpret that, but certainly at this stage, that's a very encouraging result, suggesting that there are choices that patients can choose and providers can choose what best suits them. But nonetheless, the progression-free survival benefit that we saw, which was striking, clearly favored early transplant and shows that malfline matters. And we saw that translate in other respects too. First and foremost, we saw it translate to the question of quality of response. Now, interestingly, the response rates overall were identical between the two arms. Where the differences came out were in complete response, very good partial response, very importantly in MRD negativity. That's where we saw a difference start to emerge. Now, very interestingly, the VGPR, as we call it, and CR rates were not too dissimilar, but MRD was. And this helped us understand the impact potentially of high-dose melphalan. Having said that, because there's no overall survival difference, recognizing that follow-up to some extent remains relatively early, nonetheless, this was a key finding. And the use of other treatments as salvage could therefore be entertained. And so to your question, Muriel, about quality of life, we showed a very important finding. Well, number one, there was clearly more toxicity issues with high dose therapy early, with high dose melphalan early. This was translated in a higher rate of what we call CTC um, version uh, five measured toxicities. And these assess the severity of toxicity according to the treatment arms. And there we clearly saw that the high dose arm did have uh, some challenges with tolerability. Having said that, these were all reversible in the vast majority of cases. And our treatment related mortality rates for both arms remained very low. Having said that too, however, there was nonetheless a numerical uh, uh, increase in the number of treatment-related deaths to the transplant arm, approximately six compared to just one um, for the delayed transplant arm. So again, it's very small numbers overall, but important for providers to bear in mind. I think what's also critical was that we saw a quality of life difference clearly against transplant early during the course of the transplant and around three or four months around that time. Encouragingly though, for our patients, these were covered. And what we showed was that if you'd gone through the early transplant, your quality of life actually meaningfully recovered 
um, as, as you got further away from the transplant and both quality of life measures equalized over time. So this was an important finding. But when we drill down hard on long-term side effects, one thing did emerge that was very important to understand. We clearly saw that there was a higher rate of AML and myelodysplastic syndrome for the patients who received high-dose melphalan early. Now, the actual numbers were small, but nonetheless, 10 patients on the early transplant arm experienced AML or MDS. And in fact, none of the patients on the uh, delayed transplant or transplant kept in reserve arm experience the same complication. Now, gratifyingly, these numbers are small, but they're nonetheless very important as we try to better understand um, the implications of our therapeutic choices. I think what's very important to understand overall, however, is that the race, rates of second primary cancers across both arms were actually about the same. The one subgroup that emerged that was different was the AML and MDS group. A small number, but we do know that that increases over time so we have to monitor that very carefully, I think, going forward and better understand who's at risk of that. And if we can identify who those people are, perhaps not expose them to high dose melphalan early in the course. An excellent question, Muriel. And I think the, uh, a variety of points, I think, emerge. Number one, you know, for those patients in whom transplant was considered an important option for them to receive at salvage, they so did. And as I mentioned, that was around 28% of the delayed transplant arm. 72%, however, did not. And they went on to exciting novel treatment platforms that can be employed um, later in the disease course. And clearly these have proven efficacious because we have not seen a survival difference, therefore, um, with long follow-up. However, what strikes me is that clearly we have a progression-free survival benefit that exceeds our expectations substantially. And that, I think, is very good news in the sense that it shows that there is something in high-dose melphalan followed by autologous stem cell support that makes a difference. And that above all, um, lenalidomide maintenance until progression also is critical in improving outcome. That applies to both arms, but it may be a particular effect um, that's magnified after transplant uh, in, the, in, in that particular group of patients. However, the fact that that doesn't translate into a survival difference in the longer term suggests there may be patients who get particular benefit from transplant, and there unfortunately may be patients in whom they do not. And so as a result of that, better understanding who those two groups or several groups of patients are, I think is a critical way forward, especially now that we have not just three drug regimens in 2022, but the really exciting thing for patients and providers alike is that we now have quadruplets, you know, four drugs. In other words, the uh, proteasome inhibitor, an immunomodulator steroid and a monoclonal antibody. And these are really changing the therapeutic landscape um, for us in transplant eligible myeloma and indeed in non-transplant eligible patients too. So I think the implications from this study are, are really very broad. Um, they can invite the question that, you know, we've got good salvage options in reserve, so a patient can decide to collect stem cells and potentially wait and, and decide whether or not the transplant makes sense. Alternatively, for those patients whom, whom clearly a transplant does make sense, we clearly show evidence of clinical benefit as reflected um, by that striking pre progression-free survival benefit.